Okay, this is Seth Iskan with Soil for Climate, and um, welcome to the webinar of Fireside Chat with Regenerative Agriculture Hero Gabe Brown of Brown's Ranch, North Dakota. And the focus of this seminar is really reflections from his historic um, congressional testimony last week, February 25th, to the House Agricultural Committee on um, climate change impacts on agriculture and forestry and, um, and, and gave, gave wonderful testimony that was also preceded by the trailer from the Kiss the Ground film. And I'm delighted to say that Finian Makepeace, one of the executives at Kiss the Ground and one of the creative architects and visionaries behind that film is also here to join us today and will um, will give a little, give us a little background on that. So, Carl, do you want to do uh, unmute yourself and do the formal uh, introduction for Gabe? Sure, I'll be happy to do that. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're honored to have with us today uh, regenerative farmer Gabe Brown. Uh, many of you may know him from his leading role in the uh, Kiss the Ground. Um, uh, Netflix documentary um, on regenerative agriculture. Uh, Gabe is also author of the book Dirt to, to Soil, One Family's Journey into Regenerative Agriculture. Uh, Gabe has a 5,000 acre farm uh, cropping and grazing in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. And um, he's also featured in, there's a short video uh, called uh, Soil Carbon Cowboys. And Gabe is one of the three farmers who's profiled in, in that film. Um, as I'm sure Gabe will discuss as, as the program goes along. Uh, his farm originally started out back in the 90s as a, very much a conventional operation, but then through several years of uh, bad weather and, um, and difficult, um, difficult times, uh, Gabe began researching uh, practices that were used uh, by our uh, forefathers and, and mothers uh, going back hundreds of years ago. And that led him to um, embracing no-till, diversified cover crops, uh, ultimately holistic plant grazing. And since then he's seen rapid improvement in his soil and the infiltration rate of rainfall. Um, he's also um, uh, become uh, very productive uh, in terms of growing crops without the need for any synthetic fertilizer, I believe since 2007, if I have that correct. So um, Gabe has uh, really emerged a, as a model for, for many farmers throughout the world who are looking at how to improve their operations and create a healthier environment and, uh, and, and put a little more money into their bank accounts as well. So it's a, it's a great honor to have Gabe with us um, and Finney and Make Peace as well from Kiss the Ground. So welcome to both of you. Uh, Carl, thank you for that introduction. So Gabe, let's, let's hand it over to you. Um, just quickly give some, some background about you know, how you got to give this testimony in the first place. And then, uh, then we'll bring in Finian because I know he was instrumental in that. And then we're going to show the trailer for the Kiss the Ground movie as well. Um, so, uh, Gabe, over to you. Thank you, Seth, Carl. Pleasure to be with you today. Uh, yeah, it started out when uh, I had first got a text from Finian wanting to know if uh, he could talk to me for a few minutes, and and always try and and oblige Finian because. Uh, the whole agricultural community and the world for that matter owes Finian and, and the folks at Kiss the Ground a big thank you for all the work that, that they're doing to move regenerative ag forward. And so Finian called me and said, hey, uh, there's a real opportunity that has uh, arose for a farmer to come before the House Ag Committee and uh, we'd like to know if you'd be interested. Well, I have to admit, I've been asked to do this before and I've turned it down because Gabe Brown in Washington is not one of the things that kind of goes together. However, then Finian uh, said, oh, by the way, it'll be virtual. And I said, okay, I, I, will, I will do it. So it really, you know, was the doings of Finian and the group at Kiss the Ground that made this all happen. You're muted there, Seth. So. Yeah, Finian, why don't uh, why don't you come on in and say a few words about about how the testimony happened, and even 
what you were thinking literally like as you were watching it and then we'll we'll show the kiss to ground trailer oh the, the second half of that was that was that was the <laughs> that was awesome and scary all at the same time but uh this is a, a great story of how this came uh to fruition um and i think a reminder for all of us seth and, and gabe and everyone out there to to be the invite to this movement for for anyone who's showing interest and and desire to help uh, so the, the situation that happened was from a woman named Arthi. So she came to kiss the ground. She's a health practitioner. She said, I want to help. I want to be involved. We were like, you're great. You know, we, you know, people we know, cool, come on in. And she became an advisor for kiss the ground. And then she happened to know Congresswoman Jaya Paul because she is in her district uh, in Washington. So when the film came out, she asked Congresswoman who she had a relationship with, a uh, slight friendship with her as the Congresswoman from her district. And she said, you got to watch this film. And she, she kind of hounded her. She pushed her heart. She says, you got to watch this film if you have time, whenever you have time. I think around 15 or so times, she, she literally asked the Congresswoman to watch this film. So finally, she did watch it. And she really had you know these aha moments that so many of us have had. And so immediately, Congresswoman Jaya Paul knowing that uh, Congressman uh, Rep. Scott from Georgia was probably going to be the one who became our next chairman of the House Ag Committee, she said, okay, you and I just had a conversation recently, and I just had a call with uh, Congressman Jaya Paul a couple days ago, so this is, this is her version of the story. She said uh, that, that the Congressman Scott had asked her, hey, would you be supporting me if I was running for chairman? And she said, yeah, and they talked a bit, and then she said, you got to watch this film. And so he went and watched it the same night that she recommended it and wrote back to her the next day and said, oh my God, I watched the film. We got to see how we can include this message in the hearing, my first hearing. And so that was the first thing that was happening come December, early December. And we were excited. We got a couple of notifications of this and Arthi was connecting us to the staff at the Ag House Ag Committee, just starting to get the connections. And then of course, January happened, everything kind of shut down. And then towards the end of January, we reached back out to the staff from the Ag Committee and we started to develop a relationship to say, how, how can we best make this work uh, so that uh, regenerative agriculture gets a moment to be amongst uh, those other players that are going to be doing their version of what climate and ag mean. And so we started to build, a, I think, a great rapport with uh, Chairman Scott's team at the House Ag Committee. And we started to figure out who, who could best be positioned to, to take this role uh, to represent farmers as well as the regenerative ag community. And so we just were, it was a relationship building. And that's what I encourage all these folks out here listening today is so much of this stuff ends up being how, how are you offering something? How are you showing up to help? And at the end of the day, I think that's what makes the difference so that people are, are wanting to work with you. So um, when it came down to who are we gonna nominate uh, there was a lot of deliberation uh, and Gabe's name rose to the top and uh, we made that pitch to them and they gave it the green light. So they had also been saying, how do we get the film included? And so uh, we actually made a longer cut of, of the trailer that was, I guess, too long for the hearing. So they ended up going with the original trailer. So it was a, it was a lot of relationship building and, and figuring out how we can work with, with their teams to help this message get across. And Chairman Scott is really at the source of this. And he's been telling other uh, representatives all through Congress to watch the film. And Congresswoman Jaya Paul said like, she's getting Congress people like high school, like, oh, I heard about this film from Chairman Scott and he told me to watch it and I watched it, thank you. And so it's just a really cool momentum that's happening. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's the story. And it was daunting and nerve wracking and amazing and fun to watch Gabe at the hearing is the short answer to your second part of the question. All right, Finney, well, thank you. You're, you're a hero, too, and the, the whole Kiss the Ground team, really, and uh, getting that movie is part of the testimony, and then getting Gabe there. I just just love it. Um, so I tell you what, let's show the Kiss the Ground trailer now, um, and then, and then we'll, we'll open it up for discussions, and you know, uh, people will ask Gabe about the testimony. And Seth, can, can I add one, one thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People yeah, go for can it. watch the beginning of the testimony, or the hearing, when he... Be, before he introduces it, Chairman Scott, his interpretation of the film, I think is quite something to see uh, that that tool of the film as a, as a model of what can set people's mind up, 
what he says before the intro to Gabe, I, I thought was really extraordinary. So if you get a chance to watch the actual testimony, please do. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Let me let me put that in all the announcements for this event on Zoom, on Eventbrite, on Facebook. We have all of the links there. So there's the links to to the to the full testimony, which includes um, uh, Chairman Scott's introduction of the movie itself. I mean, how profound is that? You have the chairman of the House Agricultural Committee, you know, introducing the Kiss the Ground movie as part of official hearing on climate change. It's just, it's just profound. Um, and uh, and um, so yes, you should watch that. But also, let's just let's just watch the trailer now itself. It's two and a half minutes. I'm going to stream it as part of this. So let me just quickly do a screen share on that, and then we'll we'll all come right back. There's so much bad news about our planet, it's overwhelming. Truth is, I've given up. This is the story of a simple solution, a way to heal our planet. The solution is right under our feet, and it's as old as dirt. All of our soils that are under chemical conventional agriculture are almost completely devoid of microorganisms. Modern agriculture was not designed for the betterment of the soil. Fossil fuels are by no means the only thing that is causing climate change. When we damage soil, carbon goes back to the atmosphere. But when we destroy soil, it releases carbon dioxide. Biosequestration is using plants, trees, and techniques of grazing and farming to capture carbon and store it in the soil. We can fix a lot of our climate issues if we bring the CO2 down into a living plant and put it back into the soil where it belongs. Plants working with soil microorganisms, it seems too simple. Healthy soils lead to a healthy plant. Healthy plant, healthy human, healthy climate. There could be a way to eat food that heals the planet. The problem isn't the animal. The problem is where the animals are at. How do we take waste and repurpose and reuse it because it's really not waste? The poop has to stay in the loop. Compost is just one of a suite of soil-based carbon capture solutions. We know how to do it. And if we continue to scale over 30 years, we can reverse global warming. We can get the Earth back to the goal. By regeneration. To see biodiversity return to a place that was completely devastated. That gives me hope. Our health and the health of our planet are connected. If you look over here, my neighbor's land that has been chemical fallow, then you look over at our paddocks, you have a diversity of different plant species. Which model do you want your food to be produced from? The answer is pretty simple to me. I'll make you a deal. I won't give up, and neither should you. All right, how about that? Let's get a yabo. Come on, everyone, let's get a yabo on that. Finian, really, just outstanding. Um, just real quick, Finian, share with us, like, literally, how did you feel when you, when you saw that happening? And then we'll go to Gabe, and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Go ahead and unmute, Finian. Yeah, it was, it was definitely surreal stuff in terms of, you know, the, I'm, I'm our policy director, Kiss the Ground, and it's uh, a lot of the things I've been doing in policy have been oriented around California and seeing this happen at the federal level. And I feel like the, the, the meaning for me was seeing the chairman and then a few, not definitely not all, not even half, uh, but seeing some of these representatives uh, having aha moments around different aspects. And that to me is, is really what we're all working on is, is opening up the minds that are ready to open and then working with them to continue to spread this because the whole thing was a context of how do we do a little better with the broken system we have that's the sustainable think paradigm that technology is going to solve here or there a uh, very few people are starting to get and i hope the chairman actually did is this opportunity of regeneration what it means and what that can take us towards so i'm hopeful because i saw a few of those moments start to shift in some of these representatives and and that's where we go from 
Excellent, Finian. Well, th th thank you so much. And, uh, uh, it, it, you know, there's been a lot of frustration, honestly, as, as we all know. But, 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 you know, people like you just uh, stay calm and just keep putting, putting forward the positive message. And, and that's really what it takes. So, so we're all learning. Thank you. And, uh, and same to you, Gabe. Gabe, just, just really quickly, share your own thoughts about um, the, that um, event of seeing that movie and being in the movie, and, and, uh, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Sure. So as that trailer was being played, all I could think of was, wow, have things changed in the last five years especially? Uh, and, you know, I've been at this a long, long time, Seth and Carl, and, and at times it seemed like those of us out there touting regenerative ag and these principles are beating our head against the wall. But a real change started probably about seven years ago. Then I've really noticed in the last five years, I, we feel like the snowball is finally getting to the top of the hill. And it's going to start rolling downhill. And when I saw that trailer being played uh, uh, there in front of Congress, it was like, okay, okay, now we're going to get some traction. Now, hopefully, they'll realize that that agriculture is a major part of the solution. Not, we don't have to look at it as part of the problem. But that's what was going through my mind. And, 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 you know, Gabe, what, while it was going on, I was, I was blogging away in the Sulphur Climate Facebook group, like, yes, it's happening. <laughs> the revolution is here. Yep. And uh, people, people were loving that. So watching it in real time really was special. Okay. Um, so so um, uh, my lead question, and in many regards, uh, respects, like the highlights for me was seeing the movie and then your third slide, you know, so in slide number three, um, you know, you have a quote from from Alan Savory saying um, it's not droughts that cause bare ground. It's bare ground that causes the droughts. Yep. And I was like, score. Um, and then um, and then after your presentation, um, Congressman Jim McGovern of Massachusetts sort of asked about a roadmap. And so so my lead question is. Tell us just a little more about that roadmap. You know, what is what is it, and, and how does thinking holistically, uh, you know, work work into that? You know, how, how... Oh, I'm not sure if uh, go for it, Gabe. Okay, I wasn't sure if you quit talking. You're breaking out a little bit, but uh, you know, I was asked that question a number of times, and realize you've got about 30 seconds to answer. And so I kept coming back to education because you don't know what you don't know. So we have to educate everyone, not only farmers and ranchers, but policymakers and consumers as to the importance of regenerative ag, as the, to the importance of where and how they spend their, their food dollars and how they lead their lives. Is it truly in a regenerative path? But as far as answering your question, that roadmap, so my partners and I at Understanding Ag, we, we've developed a pretty sound track record of how we take farmers and ranchers and lead them down this path. The first thing is you have to take them where they're at, in their context, wherever that may be. And it doesn't matter where they're located, we can work with them. And we're not going to take a farmer who is financially strapped and out doing uh, the conventional model, heavy tillage and fertilizers and pesticides and immediately switch them over to an organic no-till situation. That's not going to happen. You know, so you have to take them where they're at, where they feel comfortable with, and then where can they make the most strides that will benefit them not only financially, but also ecologically. And that's where we start, whether that be, uh, well, you mentioned this slide, the quote from Alan Savory. And, you know, I just want to thank Finian for all the time he put in helping me put that testimony together and especially the written testimony. And when we were determining which slides to put in, we both agreed that had to be one of them. Because my friend Ray Archuleta always says, 
if we could just get people to cover the soil with a living plant, think of what we could do. It was interesting to me, and I'm getting off track here a little bit, but but during the testimony, I heard over and over again from these congressmen how wonderful agriculture is in their district. And I finally had to say, say, really, have you been on a plane lately and looked down? I mean, it's not green and growing, you know, it's, it's, there's bare soil and uh, it's a good thing I have no hair because I, I would have pulled it all out about that day. And, and that's where you start. That's my point. The roadmap is you take people where they're at and what they're able to do. And, and I really appreciate the, the, uh, what Kiss the Ground has to say that, that you ask people, well, what, what, where are your strengths and what can you do to help the movement? And we all do our own little part and that's gonna be different for each and every one of us. And so it is with the farmers moving down this path. I've had farmers that start with just two acres behind the hill where no neighbor will see because that's what they feel comfortable with, planting a cover crop there. And then I've had uh, uh, clients who 8,000 acres of covers the first year because it just makes sense to them but you have to take them where you're at and you start moving them down the path. And as they, seal, as they see their soils heal ecologically and their pocketbook heal financially, they're gonna adopt the practices at a faster and faster rate. Um, Gabe, thank, thank you so much. And um, uh, Carl and I really wanted this to, to be sort of like a, um, a, a bottom up event um and so we want um people to ask questions so i do see a hand raised but i don't uh now i now i don't see it um so people raise your hands in the reaction if you want to ask a question you see at the bottom where it says reactions and then if you click on that it says raise hand okay okay mark ludwig has raised a hand okay mark you're on go great uh gabe and, and everybody involved with soil for climate thanks so much for having this this afternoon it's really uh really great to have this little debrief uh I, i'm sure many of you who follow our facebook group know we uh go round and round on the topic of the the centrality or non-centrality of livestock whether or not livestock or cattle in particular are are uh, the secret sauce, if you will, to all of that. And I guess even though I am one of those people who does rotationally graze livestock and makes a little pocket money that way, my contention is it's the green growing plant. And I've got to say, Gabe, it, there are so many echoes of what I learned from Gary Zimmer and Midwestern Bioag. I mean, almost exactly the same model. Let's start with where they're at. Let's make you know, the practices we're proposing fit the farm and let's move them forward and really teach farmers to be ecologists. So I, I, I really, I, I think there are some roots to this movement that, that go deep and that the soil health movement's big, but I, I really feel like soil and cli for climate in particular has gotten hung up in this endless circular debate about the centrality of livestock. And I would really like to see us move on to the centrality of plants because really, I think it's that green growing plant that's the key to all of this and how we take a surplus off that green growing plant is much less important. So I'll, I'll stop yammering and uh, give up the floor here. Okay, uh, I'll start there. And yes, you do need the green growing plant. More, even more important, you need a diverse community of green growing plants. However, it is proven that when that green growing plant is grazed by livestock, it will pump significantly more amounts of carbon into the soil. And therein lies the key. You're, you're exactly right that, that green growing plants are the start, but realize how they evolved and how the ecosystem works. You really need that plant bitten by livestock to make massive change. And I'll never forget, I'll just relay this little story uh, back in 2006, I was speaking at a conference in Canada, and I had this Canadian in front of me when it was over, jammering in my face about what he was doing, and it was Neil Dennis. 
And Neil talked about grazing a million pounds uh, stock density per acre. And Gabe, you got to come to my place, see what I'm doing. And, and I, we, you know, we set up till 2.30 that first morning talking. And so that spring, I drove up to Neil's. And Neil was grazing these high stock density on pastures. And we looked at the soil. And I'll never forget driving home. And I just crossed through the border crossing. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I went, Gabe, that's the answer. I've got to get that type of stock density on my cropland to pump massive amounts of carbon into that cropland to heal those cropland soils. I, I immediately went home. We had cover crops growing on cropland. And at that time, we were just going to use them for winter grazing. I told my son about it. He said, yep, makes sense. We started uh, running high stock density on living plants uh, that were growing on cropland fields. The change I saw on my cropland on the aggregation, the, the nutrient cycling, water infiltration was amazing. And I'm going, this is the answer. And I was just mad at myself because, Gabe, come on, that's how soils were formed with bison and, and grazing ruminants. So I think it's a matter of levels. Yes, green growing plants are first. We need to cover the soil with diverse communities of green growing plants, but the livestock integration is a major key to take it to the next level. And as Seth and Carl reminded me, as uh, Richard, Dr. Richard Teague points out, massive amounts of carbon can be had uh, by integrating grazing ruminants. Gabe, thank you so much. And uh, Mark, thank you for that question. Um, let me jump in here too, because obviously I have some of the blame or credit, depending on how you want to put it, for the tonality of this Oil for Climate Facebook group in regards to the livestock conversation. You know, it's, it's only because there's so much anti-livestock stuff, which is the, the dominant narrative. You know, when you have the wealthiest people in the world, like literally um, a trillion dollars worth of personal income, uh, just, you know, pumping out the narrative that livestock are bad, you know, that's that's partly what, you know, where the ire comes from, so to speak. So I apologize if it gets a little overboard so too much. And yes, obviously the grass, the, the photosynthesis is is the how it's happening, but the, the animals need to be part of that. Okay, Gabe, I see you have yeah. your hand raised. Go Can ahead. I just add something to that? This, interestingly enough, with Kiss the Ground, the movie, um, I remember visiting early on with Josh Tickell, and and early on, the movie was not going to hardly mention livestock and the importance thereof. And when Josh met Ray Archuleta and then they came up to my ranch and we explained to him just the power of grazing animals, that was a major change in the movie at that time. And, and Josh fought hard to get that into the movie, the importance of those grazing animals. Yeah, we had, this is, this is Finn. We, it was, it was tough. There, you, you had to go through the education that's why again it comes back to education whether it's the farmer or the people making the media people just don't know what they don't know it's just true and they, they're living in a context of oh this is what i've been taught this is how it is and then all of a sudden when they get it they can actually see it and i that's why i lead with all folks out there is is this starts with context and you know there are subtropic regions that are you know agroforestry systems that of course that doesn't make sense to have grazing livestock never has never will they, that's not where they were that's not where they evolved but it's a context and that to me always softens the blow for people so that they get a little bit of what they have to start with and you're not just full board smacking them in the head but you get to say okay yes in some places it doesn't work but in all these other places it does finny and thank you so much so let me go to the uh the questions now um John Rulak uh, is raising his hand and then Mike Carberry after him. So John, go ahead, the floor is yours. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks uh, Seth and Carl um, and Finian for uh, setting this up and Gabe for participating. Um, I, I, um, I had a couple questions, but first I have to comment. When, when, they, when the Congressman uh, asked you the question with Bayer in it, uh, I just laughed and I've like told multiple people, I said, you know, like Gabe was like, you just knocked that out of the park. You just sidestepped and went around. 
And I bet you like if, if a bunch of us had that question thrown to us, we might have like taken the bait. Uh, and, and so anyways, great job on that, you know. Um, the other, other couple things is one, uh, curious, what are some of the things that have come out of since testifying, just maybe any highlights, you know, that you wanted to share? And then secondly, um, um, have you worked with many farmers who are growing uh, radish as a dual crop with, um, with wheat, um, you know, for, for uh, you know, to, fix, to help the soil? I just started hearing about that. I was, uh, I was talking to Darren Unruh. He was mentioning uh, how successful that was. Uh, I'm just curious your thoughts on that as, as well. Gabe, you're muted, brother. Um, first, the, to answer your first question, John, uh, how have things changed? Well, uh, <laughs> my inbox is even fuller, which I didn't think would be possible. But, but <clears throat> we've noticed, uh, those of us uh, who are active in this movement, since Kiss the Ground, the movie came out, there's been a there's been a sharp uptick in interest in regenerative practices. We've also noticed a significant increase in businesses that are interested in regenerative ag. Uh, some are approaching it from from the carbon aspect and offsetting carbon credits, but more are interested in it from supply chain dynamics and how they can ensure a a adequate supply of high quality products to, to fuel their businesses and they want them produced in a regenerative manner. And so we've been working an awful lot on that. Uh, we've got a number of major players that have come to us and, and want us to move their supply chains forward. Now to answer your question on the, the radishes in wheat, this is something that's been done for quite a while. Uh, I will give Steve Groff from Pennsylvania credit. He did some of the original work with Dr. Ray Weil. And what they found is with your fall seeded biennials such as winter wheat, winter triticale, cereal rye, if you add two pounds of daikon radish when you're seeding those in the fall, you can expect anywhere from five to 11 bushel yield increase due to the nitrogen release from those radishes because they are nitrogen scavengers. They'll, they'll uptake nitrogen and release it in the spring for those cereals to use. Right, thanks. And what do you think is the major blockage for people not doing that? Is it, some people just said it's too much of a hassle, like larger growers or what's the, is it just only lack of education or what's the? Yeah, um, I, had to bite my lip more than once in that testimony and just to keep from screaming. You know, it's difficult for a government to realize that, that I often get asked, what's the biggest obstacle in holding up farmers from the adoption of regenerative practices? Hands down, it's the current farm program. The current yeah. farm program for the most part, not all, but for the most part is very antagonistic to the adoption of regenerative practices because 95% approximately of farm operators need to borrow operating money from lending institutions to put the crop in the ground. Those lending institutions are not gonna loan money unless a, a farmer operator uh, it is not signed up for the current farm program. And that current farm program dictates monocultures and the current production model. So that's the biggest holdup, John. I'd say yeah, crop insurance also is a big one, which is related to all of that. Well, well, yes, that's what I meant when I said RMA, you know, RMA Risk Management Association is crop insurance. Yes, you're right. Okay, um, I would like to get to some more questions that are up. And... Um, so next is Mike Carberry and then Natalie Fleming. Uh, Mike, I, I know who you are, of course, but why don't you <laughs> why don't you introduce yourself as well? So so people. Well, 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 thank you, Seth, and thanks for all that you and Carl do as soil for climate. And uh, I, um, Mike Carberry, I'm with the Iowa Farmers Union in Iowa, but I also do a lot of work with the Sierra Clubs, uh, 
uh, grassroots uh, network team called the Food and Agricultural Team. And I wanna thank everybody on here for three things, for educating, advocating, and agitating. And especially Seth and John Rulock and some other people, we need to be disruptors at this point and we need to educate. So I, I've done work with uh, Dave Murphy. I've done work with Finian. Uh, the people on this call are my heroes, especially Gabe Brown. And thank you, Gabe, for all that you do. I use a quote from you in my signature for my email that uh, uh, we have to stop treating our soil like dirt. Now, I'm not sure if you said those exact words, but if I've paraphrased it, uh, I apologize. But my question on education is I really looked at the four different groups to educate. There's the farmers, the consumers, the politicians, and the media. And I'd like to ask Gabe or Finian or anybody else, of those four, who's the most important group to, that we need to educate? Thank you, and uh, I, I'm just honored to be able to be on this call and, and hear all those wise words from Gabe and Finian and everybody else, and John as well. Thank you. Wow, thank you for that. I'll take a stab, Finian, and then I'll turn it over to you. In my mind, the most important to educate is the consumer, because consumers will drive change throughout the whole society. You know, all we need to do is get consumers to realize that, number one, they can affect their own health positively by, by uh, purchasing food that is grown and raised in a regenerative manner. And, and, you know, my friend, Dr. David Montgomery has a new book that's at the publisher right now, entitled, You Are What Your Food Ate. <laughs> and I've been privileged enough to see part of that book. It is really uh, an eye opener to some. So I would say consumers. With that, I'll turn it over to Finian. Thanks, Gabe. Um, I, I, I kind of want to do an add on. Um, I've thought a, a lot about this, as you might imagine. But uh, what I see is an example of what just happened here is where are people invited to go to the next level? Because while consumers, I could agree with that in, in a large scale sense, but oftentimes it's a consumer or a person on any of these fronts who becomes empowered that becomes the difference that makes the difference. So that I, why I told you that Arthi connected with us to see if she could help and we brought her in as an advisor, that's the difference I think that made the difference that empowered her enough to ask her congresswoman instead of once 15 times to watch Kiss the Ground the movie. That is a consumer that's got this. And she's doing, it's cause it's a, it's a why buddy. Sorry, daughter question too. Um, so she was a consumer. So she got that for herself. But what, what I'm imploring my advocates who we train from soil advocate training is if you're on the consumer side, convince the bigger consumers. Companies are mega conscious consumers just waiting to be conscious consumers for Regen Ag. Why don't you do your thing? That's great. But also be the cause of a supply chain shift that creates this demand for local purchasing decisions or what have you. Where can you maximize that consumer thing as an individual, as a community? And this is where I think the, the strength in numbers really starts to go is when we say, People can be more than just individuals when they start to act as, as innovators and uh, creators of where things are going. That's when I think the, the big shifts are to happen. So I would say empowerment of advocates is on all fronts. Every single one of these farmers, are they spreading awareness? Politicians, are they spreading awareness? Consumers, are they spreading awareness? Everyone acting as advocates for this. Good point. Okay, yeah, I'm unmuted now. All right, uh, thank you, thank you for those those answers, Finian and Gabe. Uh, now we have a question from Natalie, and I don't see any other hands raised yet. So again, a reminder, friends, um, this is billed as a fireside chat, so we want people. Oh, now I see the hands raised. Okay, good. So Natalie, um, you, and then James, um, uh, 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 Bradley and then Linda Coltier. Okay, Natalie, unmute yourself, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Hello, Gabe. I wish I could take up all the time with a list of about 20 questions, but I have to be merciful here. E email um, me. <laughs> okay. Well, just so you know, first of all, I want you to know that I tell people my friend Gabe Brown, so I need you to cover for me. Can you cover for me? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So I, I refer to you as my friend all the time. So I live in Idaho. And here we have uh, the big, we, of course, we have a lot of corn and wheat, but we have potatoes, onions, and sugar beets. And I did try to talk Brad McIntyre here. I believe you've met him in Marsing, Caldwell, Idaho. He's wonderful. We need to have some more research on no-till and low-till on potatoes, onions, and sugar beets. And when you drive in the countryside here in wintertime right now, you'll see the, bear, the, the land is all brown and dirt, and we didn't have much snowfall this year. But the first question, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to keep it to one. If you'll humor me, I might give you a second one. But do you know of people who have researched uh, using these methods with the root crops? Because Idaho can't make this transition until we can get the potatoes, onions, and sugar beets going. Okay, Natalie. Well, I was in Idaho all week. Okay, <laughs> I flew into Boise and I was at Twin Falls and and. Uh, uh, we do quite a bit of work in Idaho, and yes, Brad and Ma Ma the McIntyre family are close friends of mine, as are you. And and here's the answer to that. Yes, we have clients and I uh, have friends who are growing root vegetables. Uh, North Dakota isn't too far behind Idaho in, in the production of, uh, of uh, potatoes, and I believe we're ahead of Idaho in the production of sugar beets. So I'm very familiar with those root crops. The key is you're obviously with any of the root crops, you're gonna have tillage. But as Brendan Rocky at Rocky Farms, potato grower in the San Luis Valley of Colorado has shown, what he does is he grows a potato crop on part of a circle pivot, and then he grows a cover crop on the rest. And that cover crop is attracting the predator and pollinator insects that then allow him to produce potatoes at a much lower cost with, as you know, potatoes are, <laughs> most of those red vegetables, they apply a lot of fungicides and pesticides. He has essentially eliminated all those off of his farm. Then what he does, he brings in the neighbor's cattle to graze those cover crops. Then the next year where it was covers, the year before will be potatoes, where it was potatoes will be covers. And he is actually growing cover crops in with the potatoes now, species such as buckwheat and flax to attract beneficial insects. He has found that he's much more profitable now doing that than he was when he had his potato malting barley rotation. And there's others like it. Uh, we are actually working with some of the largest potato growers to move their potato farms down this regenerative path and reduce those harmful insecticides. Have you spoken to Simplot yet? <laughs> they have not reached out to us yet. <laughs> now, do you have, where can I go to find out more? Because I have to be able to document this because I got to push this year in Idaho. Yep. Yeah, and you can go to our website, understandingag.com okay. or okay. Rocky Farms. Okay, now my other question, Seth is gonna cringe, I think. <laughs> he knows where I'm gonna go. Are you, do you know where I'm gonna go? <laughs> I always do the fractal thing where I look at this big, big picture and I get excited. I get, I start thinking like that crazy Elon Musk. <laughs> and I think that we could green the Sahara. Oh, I don't, it, I don't think and, it. I know it. And I, 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 I want to know how short a time we can do that in. But yeah. you see, I think about big, big things. Um, nature abhors extremes. And the Sahara Desert is the root cause of most of the hurricanes mm -hmm. in both hemispheres. Because the hurricanes form in the Sahal, and then they go through the Atlantic. And in the Atlantic, the, the Saharan dust makes it even hotter there, preventing uh, low-lying clouds. And then it hits us and some of those hurricanes and storms pass through Central America and hit the Pacific and go and hit China. There, so the, there. the global picture for me, I look at this and my brain just explodes. So yeah, and, and we would love the challenge and I guarantee we could do it. And proof of that lies, for example, with Alejandro Carrillo in the Chihuahuan Desert and what's he's done, what he's done. And he did that 
in literally about 12 years. He changed it from a desert and don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. It's still a very brittle environment. I will never forget Alejandro once, uh, he works for us. He's one of his, our consultants now. And we were doing a workshop and he was asked the question, well, how much rainfall do you get? And he said, well, we'll average between six and eight inches a year, but I really don't need that much. And I thought, wow, if Alejandro can do this down there on less than six inches of precipitation, and I've been on his ranch, I've seen it. You drive through hundreds of miles of desert, you open his gates and you're standing in grass, knee to waist deep. And the only difference is management, or as I like to call it, stewardship. That's yeah. the only difference. Can we re-green deserts like the Sahara? Absolutely. Cool. It's, it's bigger than the U.S. And the other aspect, because it all comes back, everything for me comes back to hurricanes. Can we stop that? Can we mitigate the hurricanes? And that's a, that's a big question, but it, it leads to a lot of good information. And when we talk about life on, on land and life in the ocean, it's the same way. We, we have deserts mm -hmm. in the ocean forming. And it's the same principles. And the animals in the ocean produce aerosols that produce low-lying clouds in the ocean, just like the plants create aerosols. Um, yep. that for the line clouds. So anyway, can I'll, I, I'll can I, go. this is Finian. Can I add a quick little thing? Yes, go. Natalie, I totally hear what you're saying. And one thing that I encourage the advocates I train when they're out there and excited about things is when we can connect things to people in places that they live or are close to, and they can see it. So, mm -hmm. um, Jessica Nad is an amazing advocate that we work with and her understanding of how brittle environments can go into desertification very quickly and understand what bare soil is doing in her local region to understand what it means when it rains, ineffective rainfall, et cetera. I would argue, while some of what you're saying is very real and potentially huge, yeah. when we're able to see people grasp this situation of the rate of degradation in the United States in their district happening today, four tons of soil per acre per year lost on all the ag land. When they see the ramifications of it and then see the opportunity of regenerating it and shifting their water cycles locally and making those ground, those clouds come back and all those things, that's where I see honestly more uh, impact and effectiveness right now, today, and the next years ahead because we can give people that empowerment as not something distant, far away that they're not necessarily touching, seeing, feeling. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'll and, hand it off to the next person. I'll monopolize all the time. <laughs> oh, and, and then Natalie, thank you for the big picture uh, question there. Let me say something about that for a second too. I mean, I mean, yes, of course, that's the whole point. I mean, we're looking itself, not the, not the Sahara Desert. Um, Okay, I'm hearing that my audio isn't great. Um, anyway, uh, thank you, Natalie, for that uh, for that question and for thinking big. Um, we have um, Linda Colter is next, and then James Bradley, and uh, and and some other hands I'm seeing. So, Linda, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, Linda Colter. I'm screening in here from Plymouth, United Kingdom. I'm a consumer. Um, I was so encouraged to see this ground. It was just such an awesome film. I've watched it twice and tell everybody about it. I've got a few comments to begin with, and I'll ask a, a question. Um, I've, I've sort of dried up here. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I, I say I'm really encouraged to, to see about, about the grazing and everything, um, what the cattle are, are fed. Um, 25 years ago, we were demonstrating over here against Monsanto an introduction of genetic modified crops within the United Kingdom. Um, I also watched the other evening, I watched a film called Gather, which is about introducing the buffalo back into the America with the, the Native American Indians. But my question really is, I saw something the other day and it was really quite appalled. And what is, any, is anything being done to counteract Bill Gates and what he's, the, the agenda that he's pushing, which is totally opposite to what is the ground is saying um yeah that that's all for me i'm sorry i got a bit dried up there <laughs> okay and i will push this kiss the ground and what and regenerative agriculture in the united kingdom i'm going to get in touch with my mp who is like my congressman locally who's in 
shadow environment guy. So yeah, I'm really, really encouraged and thank you for this event. It's so wonderful to be able to participate. Thank you. Well, thank you, Linda. Uh, just before Christmas, I had the opportunity to be on a Zoom meeting with Prince Charles. And since then, uh, he's gotten a copy of my book. And, and, uh, and so I hope to hear great things coming out of there. Um, Bill Gates uh, realized there's, there's a lot of pressure on him from a lot of different people when you're a person of that kind of means. And I'm, I'm uh, hopeful because uh, currently several of his friends are clients of ours. And I'm hopeful that eventually they'll wear on him. I'm of the opinion that, that I'm gonna do the best I can to educate as many as I can, but uh, until he takes my call, uh, I, I have to focus on, on what I can. Finian, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, it's, it's crazy, you know, what's happening, the interests that are involved and, and the, the money signs for, for kind of continuing to, to take from people who are already struggling. That's a whole nother conversation, but I would go the same route with Gabe is I, I've come to terms with, I didn't know. I thought I was a no it all environmentalist. I had no idea, you know, meeting Gabe and Ray and all these people has just been a complete shift of my understanding of ecology and everything. And I thought I was someone who knew I was very confident that I was on the, you know, 98th percentile of people who understood what was happening with climate change, but I didn't know. So coming from that place, I think really helps all of us to see that there's potential in literally anyone to see this and have the aha moment at any point in their life. All right, Finian, thank you. And, um, and Linda, thank you for that question. And obviously these are important themes we're talking about, you know, the whole trajectory of the temperature of the planet and Bill Gates, yeah. right? Seth, Seth, if I may, yes. Yeah. John Rolak uh, did write a very good article addressing Bill Gates, and I think he posted that here in the chat. Uh, yes, that is an excellent article, and uh, So Off for Climate was uh, honored to collaborate on that as well. Um, let's get to some more questions. Um, it looks like James Bradley, you're next, and then Michael... Miles and then Benoit Lambert. Okay, James, uh, it, the floor is yours. My question is in reference to what Gabe was saying about the lending firms. Um, I just had the Southwest Regional Director for Southwest Bank Service or Credit Service speak in one of my ag business classes, and he was talking of how they are able to give so many. Um, loans to new starting farmers because of the FSA loans. It's a guaranteed 90% uh, loan rate there, and that's how they're mitigating risk. What do you see as a future step to these lending firms being able to mitigate risk while not being involved with the farm programs that are currently there so they can uh, essentially, you know, cover themselves in having a lot lower risk portfolio, but being able to follow the cover crops are allowing the farmers the freedom to explore these different ventures. James, good to hear from you again. James, you uh, again, Dave. pardon me. And it's always good to see you again. Thank you. Um, so excellent question. I understand what you're saying. Uh, right now we are in conversation with two very large foundations that are interested in uh, lending money to beginning farmers who are going down the regenerative path. And so we're working on it. Uh, we hope that in the near future, there will be options available specifically for be beginning regenerative farmers and ranchers. And then just one thing on the, on the policy side, the lending stuff has got to be completely reworked because it's arbitrary and doesn't make any sense for especially integrating livestock. Yep. Well, I'm glad to hear there's progress coming. It makes the future look very exciting. Yeah. 
James, we will get you into regenerative ag. <laughs> Absolutely. I cannot wait. Yeah, and, uh, you know, let me just jump in here for a second about what, what Finian was saying. Um, I mean, we're also perfect examples. You know, we, we well, speaking for myself and Carl, but, but, but so many um, people of, of our generation, you know, were raised thinking that, that animals were bad. Um, it's, in retrospect, it's just so ridiculous. You know, I don't know how I ever, ever believed that. Um, and, and now I understand how fundamental they are to soil and to, and to, and to the proper, you know, biological function. Um, and let me just say something about the whole thing about thinking big and, and you know, that soil for climate, we're literally trying to change the temperature profile of the planet. And 10 billion acres need to be restored. And a lot of that is former grasslands. It's now called desert. And no is more, uh, none is more sort of um, um, exemplary, you know, than the Sahara. 8,000 years ago, the Sahara was a wetlands. You know, there's cave art of, of ponds and, 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 um, um, and marine animals. And, you know, they've got all the evidence of this. Um, you know, the, 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 t the, the conversion from a healthy grassland to a desert and then from a desert back to a healthy grassland can happen very quickly in, in either direction, either toward degradation or toward restoration. There's, there's this, um, um, it's almost like a, like a sail um, on, on the planet. And, um, and it is profound, you know, how quickly things can go one way or the other. And so Soil for Climate has a project in Kenya that we're working on with our colleague there, with our Maasai colleague, uh, Dalmas T. And, Patti, and and the project is called Enkup Osiligi, which is the Maasai word for the promised land. And, uh, and we intend to re-green all of East Africa and Sub-Sahara Africa and, and then the Sahara as well, and also the Southwest of the United States, all of it. It's all got to be re-greened. And then large parts of the, of the U.S., that is in some type of grain agriculture, like, you know, most of Iowa, for example, um, will need to be largely restored to tall grass prairie. So, um, so there needs to be a profound rethink there, and we do need to think, to think big. Uh, let, me, let me also put in a, a promo for Soil for Climate Incorporated. We are a nonprofit 501c3 organization. You can donate to us. You can buy one of our lovely caps which is the hip thing to wear. Um, and you can donate directly to our Maasai um, fundraiser as well. For $300, you can buy and symbolically name dollars you can name a herd. You know, buy 10 cows and name a herd after you idea of buying a herd as a climate solution. Like, I just love even that concept itself. So definitely pr pr promote that. Um, and you can find us, you know, Soul for Climate. Um, the, the links are around for different ways to donate. Okay, let's get on with the questions. Um, I believe um, Michael Miles is next, then Benoit, and then A.J. Richards. Okay, Michael, the floor is yours. And un unmute yourself. Yep. Hi there. You ready? You, you got me? Okay, here we go. Um, I'm assuming that everybody on this on this uh, Zoom here knows that the practices work. Uh, there, there's no debating that. And the, and the question for me, for me and the work that I've started, you know, I've, I've been doing more for years, is advo advocacy and and education, and it, that it is like who you know, who you can make connections with, and. Uh, one of the, I guess one of the things that, uh, that amazes me and a tool that I use all the time is drawdown, Paul Hawkins drawdown, because for people that really are, are against animal agriculture, you look at drawdown and you have to go, well, wait a minute. I mean, ninth on the list of the best things you can do is silvo pasture. I taught the, Mo the Moses Organic University Silvopasture course a few years ago. And 
people people know that Paul Hawken is good on climate, or do they know that Paul Hawken is good on climate? And and all the stuff that we're that we like to, to talk about is in his book. Gabe, you're in his book. It's about making connections and uh, getting people to like move in the in the right direction people you might not even think would go there uh, but it's who knows who how we can develop those relationships uh the, the practices work we all know the practices work and i mean for what it's worth one of the one of the people that i'm trying to connect with more than anybody else are friends of mine who both work for the, uh, they both work for the Gates Foundation. And seeing all the stuff that Gates has lately with his new book, and he's, uh, he's, uh, he's all over the place, you know, people have to get to Gates. And it's good. And we can't just go, now. Nah, Gates is never going to get it. People have to work to get to these people who are standing in the way, and it takes relationships. Absolutely right. Amen to that. If I could also uh, just jump in here for a second, um, there's what I call a paradigm issue. And the, the Gates camp, if you will, they're in the less bad argument, right? Well, well it, it's not as bad as CAFO. And so they always put the CAFO scenario as like the worst case scenario. And then they say, okay, well, well, we're not as bad. We're reducing the harm. We're saying, no, you're, you're still in completely the wrong way of thinking. We need to be doing more good. We need to be restoring large parts of land and, and, and well, I mean, large parts of the earth and, and the most de degraded parts are the parts that do need the animals to be restored. You know, in New England, like where I am right now, there's way more trees here um, than there was 100 years ago, because 100 years ago, this area was just, was, it was all logged. You know, that's when the New England was a major logging area. Well, this is the type of area where it, literally, if you leave it alone, it will come back on its own, right? And so the hardwoods and the, and the pines the oaks, the maples, they literally come back on their own. We get 47 inches of rain a year. You know, but in East Africa and Sub-Sahara Africa and in Zimbabwe and in Southwest United States, it isn't going to come back on its own. It needs the animals. And so the Gates Camp and all those people, the, the conversation, Michael, to bring forward, they're still in that West, they're, they're frankly, they're in a European worldview, you know, 50 inches of rain a year or more. And so, and so that idea of doing less bad or leaving the land alone and it'll come back, it kind of works in that mindset. But for most of the world that's getting, that's getting into trouble, it doesn't. You can't leave the, the land alone. You have to intervene and you have to intervene with either what, you know, hunt millions, tens of millions of wild grazers and predators, which don't exist anymore, or livestock working as a proxy for them. And eventually, then you get some combination, which is exactly what's happening now in Zimbabwe on Alan's land. The wild animals are coming back to his land. Then people talk about rewilding. Well, they, he has rewilded. He's rewilded by doing holistic plan grazing. And again, these aren't, it's not one or the other, it's both. So anyway. Okay, let's, um, let's go on. So Benoit, you're next. So just a little bit heads up. It's already 3.07. Gabe, well, at our time, let's say it's, uh, it's 7 after the hour. Gabe has a hard stop at 25 after the hour. Uh, there's three more hands raised. So if you're quick, we'll have time to do them all. Okay, um, Benoit, the floor is yours. So Benoit, yes, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm here in Quebec. Um, my question, Gabe, uh, first of all, I enjoyed your book very, very much. And okay. I enjoyed the, the, the movie, Kiss the Ground, very, very much. <laughs> uh, my question is, I read a lot of scientific stuff and, and white papers and reports. 
And a lot of the time they say there's a saturation of carbon so in soils. You, you, you reach a, 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 a suppo supposedly a plateau. And I'm always a little uncomfortable when I read that because that doesn't seem to be the case on your land anyway. And um, I'd like to have your opinion on this, but I'd make a, a really rapid comment on top of that. I want to underline the fact that at the IPCC in 1990, the first assessment report had only one carbon removal technology. And I can announce uh, <laughs> that because I'm a reviewer with the IPCC, I can announce there will be nine uh, negative emission technologies or remo removal technologies in the um, assessment report number six in July, 2021. Uh, so, so just to understand that we are actually, uh, you know, that scientists and people that are expert in this field of carbon removal uh, are coming from far, far behind. You know, the reason, the reason uh, the Kyoto Protocol mentioned sinks 13 times uh, is only because of afforestation and reforestation. There were no soil carbon sequestration, there were no biochar, there were nothing of that. It took 15, well, what is it, 30 years almost. And I think we will reach one day maybe 25 or 30 negative emission technologies because there are many more coming. Thank you. Good. So I will just briefly answer that by saying something that I usually say to most of the groups I present to, and that is, you know, I have the good fortune, I'm on hundreds of farms and ranches all over the world every year. And I've never been on a single one, including my own, that is not degraded. And so I don't know where the end point is. You know, my branch is degraded compared to historically speaking, ec historical ecological context, what it once probably was, it's still degraded. So we're moving in the right direction. I don't believe there's an end game. We're going to be controlled in these brittle and semi-brittle environments by the amount of rainfall we get. Now, as we heal larger parts of the landscape, uh, we're gonna be able to, to get more rainfall. But if that's the case, that'll raise the level of possibility for the amount of carbon in the soil. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to see, I, I can't answer that one. Um, if I can jump in here uh, uh, quickly as well. Yeah, the question, and I know Carl may want to add to this too, but the question of uh, uh, saturation is sort of an interesting one. So what, what our thesis is, is that even though it may saturate at the top profile in terms of song organic matter percentage, so Gabe, a lot of his land is near 8% now, which is extraordinary. Uh, certainly, you know, the curve will level out at any rate. The question is, how deep does it keep going? You see, and, and there's where it's, there's where the real bang for the buck. So it may, it may level out at 6% or 7 or 8 or whatever, but it could just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper. You, you might be getting 7% down three feet deep. In fact, it, the, the webinar that we had a couple months ago with Ray Archuleta and Stephen Affelbaum, that was exactly what they were talking about, mm -hmm. you know, going... He's measuring three meters deep now. So the question of saturation is another one of those sort of um, interesting slippery slope saturation. You know, you're talking about the top six inches. You're talking about the top three feet, right? Um, so, I and, yeah, and, and, I just <laughs> I want to add, this is Finn. I want to add one thing. Yeah. It's from my depth of, of folks that I've talked to in this, it's to me often just like an arbitrarily jump a bandwagon that scientists can jump onto easily because someone did a report on a saturation thing but it doesn't really have contextual uh like uh fully fledged context of like oh this is actually what happens it's a couple reports that happened in science and people just jumped on the bandwagon it's it's i think it's important that we all just push against it and what seth said going to depth is important and then talking about management and innovations in management can keep continually changing the depth that that can occur to. So honestly, I just think it's a scientific bandwagon that was jumped onto around saturation to kind of curb the enthusiasm of Regen Ag. 
Y yes, yeah, I agree. Okay, so um, uh, just uh, some logistics. So I've just decided we'll keep the, the Zoom meeting going. Um, you know, there's 50 plus people in here now. Gabe has a hard stop in about 10 minutes, but but we'll I'll keep it going. Um, okay, next. Yeah. Uh, yeah, before yes. We, before we lose Gabe, I, I would yeah. love to hear his thoughts on uh, uh, the Ogallala Aquifer area, which has been irrigating like crazy for a hundred years and is about to run out of readily available irrigation water. How that's going to change? How how these kinds of stresses are going to change industrial agriculture before we lose him? Thank you. Okay, Gabe, and quickly, please, because a, a couple other people yeah. have been raising their hands, and I'll I want to get to them. I'll stay on and answer those people, too, Seth. Okay, all right, all right, so, thanks. Mark, to answer your question, that's why we added the sixth principle of context. We see too many people farming and ranching out of context, and I'll give you another example. In the Chihuahuan Desert, uh, Mexico, there's a block of 70,000 acres of apple trees in that desert and they're pumping from deeper and deeper into the aquifer and it's ridiculous. That just has to stop. We, we have to get back to farming and ranching in context. It's interesting you mentioned apple trees because that's what grows naturally where I am. I've even got a small orchard out here. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so there are three people with the hands raised now. So Gabe, you'll, you'll do them and then and that'll be a hard stop. Okay, AJ Richards, Carl Tiedemann and then Matt uh, uh, Hattinger. So, AJ Richards, go. Hey, thanks, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm grateful, Kiss the Ground, that as you had a path for this, that you were willing to hear another side with the animals and, and work with Gabe on that. I'm from a fifth generation ranching family in the desert southwest. And what's very clear to me is the, dis the, the, uh, the issue between the environmentalist group and the producer group is just communication. Everybody wants the same thing, but rather than coming to the table and, and and having an open conversation, we can't hear each other. And for me, this was the first movie documentary that was put together in so such good fashion that everybody had a voice at the table to see the power of that. You know, my family settled uh, in some of the last homesteading in Northern Arizona, north of the Grand Canyon. We call it the Arizona Strip in 1916. The old writings are how the grasses were shoulder high and it was easy to produce dry land crops. And then all of a sudden it dried up and they were blaming the climate on the drying and didn't realize it was them pulling out all of the resources without replacing it. So since this movie's come out, I have shared everything I possibly can. My, my uncles are still running cattle on a few thousand private acres, but in the West it's primarily BLM land. And, and this is a question I'll have for you, Gabe. But they're, they're finally listening because they have examples from people on the ground like Gabe, who's bridge the gap of conversation and communication to say, no, look, we are producers, but the environmentalists are right too. We need to be responsible for that. So they're hearing it because the conversation's working. So uh, I myself just purchased 40 acres in Southern Utah, which is in danger of becoming desertified because for a hundred years they ran sheep and depleted it. And then, I mean, I bought 40 acres for 20,000 and it gets 17 and a half inches of rain a year but it's dry and they think it's junk land. And I'm like, okay, let's teach some people some things, right? So Gabe, I'm in your uh, soil one-on-one -on -one course, one-on-one -on -one course, mm -hmm. so I can make a difference in this area. My question is, because so much land is federally controlled, you know, my uncles are running one head per hundred acres. Mm -hmm. To me, that's not nearly yeah. enough room in it to actually do anything. And we're starting to see the deserts expand. Our forests are burning down because there's not there's no no process right so the question is are there any conversations that you know or are aware of that are starting to influence pos policy change where we can if we're respectful and can do that we can make a difference on larger scales yes those conversations are being had uh they're being had more so on the local level what we're finding and we have many clients with blm forest service land etc what we're finding is there are uh, some really good individuals within those agencies that are willing to listen. And if you go and approach them and show them, uh, we can usually get a variance in place to start making change. 
And that's the way we're approaching it there. Now it also needs to be addressed, as you said, on the larger level with policy. Uh, that's a bit tougher, but, but there are conversations being had. Thank you, glad to hear that. Thanks. Excellent, excellent, Gabe, thank you. And obviously these are conversations which will be ongoing. People, please join the Soil for Climate Facebook group if you're not in it yet. And, um, and okay, let's uh, go to Carl and then to Matt. Carl, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, Nisha uh, had a question. Uh, how do we make sure we don't ask for cover crops and end up with chemical termination? Again, that's a very good question. That goes back to context. Okay, one of the many, many benefits of living in North Dakota is I get winter. So that will terminate my cover crops if I seed annuals. So we have to approach it in context wherever they're at. The type of cover crops you grow will depend on your resource concern and then the context. What season is it? What uh, cash crop are you following with? Because you can uh, use covers that'll fit your specific context. And I just wanted to, to mention also that the, on the policy side, Vienna, one second, on the policy side, a lot of what we're talking about is how are we making the adoption of uh, things like the advancement of roller crimping technology available for farmers who are doing multi-species cover and making this transition are they just saying, well, glyphosate is my only option, or is the government and others supporting them to be able to access the tools and equipment in some type of shared fashion or rental fashion that they can actually start to see, oh, I can actually go and try this out and wow, it worked versus just going with the current conversation, which is it doesn't really work. I'm just gonna have to use more glyphosate. So I think it's a it's a yes and conversation. We, we desperately need the covers to start and people see that the hairs of, there's a transformation that occurs on their soil but also having kind of a wide sweeping approach for making accessible those tools that will allow for major reductions of chemicals to happen. Uh, Finney, and thank you so much. And um, I, I, I think this will be the last question for Gabe. Um, I do see there another question has came up, but Gabe does have a hard stop at, um, at three. I'll, I'll answer them both. Uh, okay, all right. So. So uh, Matt Hadinger and then Gustav S. Matt, go ahead, the floor is yours. Uh, Matt, Matt, the floor is yours. Matt Hadinger, go for it. Sorry, I had to unmute there. Uh, thank you to you first for all participating. I saw Gabe and lacrosse quite a few years ago and had a good conversation, even uh, got a little starstruck when he took a cell phone call from me one day on soil sampling and kind of told me point blank, you're looking at the wrong things. And I want to thank you for that as well. But uh, part of my question today is more of a nuts and bolts on financials. Uh, what's your best uh, scenario for convincing your financial institution to uh, look at the direction of regenerative ag and the bonuses of that. We've been uh, certified organic for four years here and not necessarily seeing financial gains from that after the long transition process, but uh, definitely seeing changes in soil, which we like. Uh, but I wanna get more cattle on our acres and I need financing for fencing. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I get to that point, and we're not a huge operation by any means, but uh, I'm just, the short answer here is find a new banker, but uh, we're not in that position. So I'm just looking for ideas on how to get our point across and say, this is the direction we need to go. And here are examples of why. Yeah, very, very good, Matt. So uh, email me at gabe at understandingag.com and I can get you some case studies. What I think would be important for the banker to see is the 
Uh, increase in revenue per acre, always go back to dollars per acre instead of pounds in yield. Uh, we, want, we want to show them profitability and we can build a case study that by just simply dividing the, you know, using poly wire and, and increasing stock densities, you'll be able to increase revenue per acre. Send me an email and we'll help you out. Appreciate it much. Thank you. You bet, Matt. Okay, uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, Gustav, you'll be the last question uh, in this session. Uh, Gustav, the floor is yours. Okay, so hello, everybody. I'm from the country of Denmark here uh, in Europe. So I don't know if it's if if I might seem a little bit uh, irrelevant to this debate, but um, I just I just wanted to make a point here. Um, I, I, I hear we, we're talking about governments and policy, policies change um, as an important factor, and, and it is, but I, I don't think we, we are going to get that uh, without public opinion changing. So I think that that needs to be very clear when, when, we, when we look at these uh, uh, organizations that are supported by the people. If they don't, if they don't de demand the change, it, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen, and so, so that's that's just the point. Yeah, but but we, I think we, it's it's clear to see to see that when when we see <laughs> this great film, Kiss the Ground, gets so much uh, attention, and then therefore are able to penetrate into uh, Congress. So yeah, I, I just wanted to make that point. Very good, and and I agree with you, and that goes back to what Finian said. We have to we have to address all areas of society and and change that opinion, and that that's one point. I'll just end, if I may, Seth. With you know, people ask me, well, do you have any regrets growing in front of Congress? And I wish I would have spent a little more time just asking them, why can't you agree? You know, why can't you agree that increased farm profitability is a good thing? Both sides should agree on that. Why can't you agree that taking out of the carbon out of the atmosphere is a good thing? Why can't you agree that clean air and clean water are good things? Why can't you agree that increased nutrient density of food is a good thing? Because it'd be political suicide for them to go against that. And I, I wish I would have spent a little more time pushing that narrative that let's come together and agree, you know, regenerative ag is very easy to agree on unless perhaps if you're a fertilizer salesman or a chemical salesman, but like I say, they can always become cover crop seed salesmen and still make a living. So we need to come together and work together for the good of all. The wisdom, the wisdom of Gabe, it sounds like you're talking about holistic management. I am, that's the foundation <laughs> of all. Well, what were the chances? Perfect way to end. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I want to tell the people who are who are on. We'll we'll keep this going. All right. Let's just have our own little fireside chat. Uh, great big shout outs to Gabe. Oh, let me also put in a, a word for his company. Nourished by Nature. Us is the website um, for his product. So please be a good customer. Um, buy from. Uh, you know, from his product and, and other regenerative producers are out there. Let's please support all of them. Um, Ridge Shin's company is, um, uh, um, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on it. Big, big picture, big picture beef. Uh, Russ Conser has Blue Nest. Um, uh, Nico Horster near me has Shire Beef. Um, and you know, these are lots of good, good regenerative producers out there. We need to support and please support soil for climate. Uh, we have a project in Kenya, which needs funding. You can buy a cow, you can buy a herd. <laughs> How often have you been uh, given you, someone gave you a proposition to buy a herd, right? <laughs> Gabe, thank you very much. And buy Gabe's book, Dirt to Soil. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Steve, you got something behind you there. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Gabe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, love you. Okay, thank you. All right, bye bye. All right, so um, so so Gabe has left, and um, so let's just open it up. Um, people, go back to the reactions to uh, to to raise your hand. 
um, or it could be informal and you could just start talking and the mic goes to you. I, I don't want it to be uh, chaos, but um, uh, we could try that. Just, uh, just start talking and the mic will go to you. You have to unmute yourself first, though. Hey, yes, Seth, uh, this is Mike, Mike Carberry again okay. here with the Iowa Farmers Union yeah. and the Iowa Sierra Club. Um, but getting back to education uh, and uh, John Rulock's uh, articles regarding, you know, moving some of these environmental groups into the soil solution is really important. Uh, John wrote uh, an article like five years ago that talked about the, uh, the largest environmental groups not getting uh, the other half of the climate solution, which is this regenerative ag piece. And they're still very slow to uptake that solution. So if you belong to an environmental group that's working on climate and they're not working on regenerative ag, they are missing the boat. And we really need to continue to squeeze the shoes of the Sierra Club, Greenpeace, any other environmental group that you're working on that's working on climate, if they're not part of the soil solution, they've missed the boat. And so uh, thanks for all that you're doing. I'm going to have to drop off here. I got a lot of other work to, to take care of, but I'm just really, uh, I thought this was a really, really great uh, opportunity to hear Gabe and it was a great conversation. Nice to see you, Mike. Yeah, Mike. Thank thanks, you. Carl. Thank, thank you, you Seth. And yeah. Thanks to Finn and everybody else. And, uh, that was on the call, really great comments, great questions. Uh, you should do this uh, uh, a lot more often. Thank you. All right, we're working on it, thank you. Uh, I see I see Virginia, just heads up, Virginia has been patient and actually has raised her hand. Go, go Virginia. So, so let's, uh, let's give the floor to Virginia. All right, go for it. Thank you, thank you, Seth. Um, what, um, what, I, what I'd like to um, ask and perhaps discuss more and, and maybe even have other sessions on is how are we going to start educating young farmers when they when they start out well you know, we're doing a lot of talk about helping farmers who are already doing things the wrong way start do it the right way but what about all the farm schools and teach them at, at first the miracle of the soil and and teach them the right way first uh, that frustrates me because i I don't know any other programs except out at Chico State. Maybe there are more. Um, can, can I can I try an answer on that? This is Finian. Yeah. Go, go for it. Yep. Yeah, I think I think it's up to all of us. And I think the thing that I challenge myself personally is what what am I going to help cause with my community and those around to make happen? So you say, okay, there's there are universities. Who on this call is going to make sure that the next five years prolifically expand their education and curriculum for Regen Ag? What are the steps to get there? Do we start with making sure that soil uh, Regen Ag 101 is able to be in the Iowa school and college as an actual course and get course credits for it? Do we then work further and make uh, curriculum available, make sure um, ad hoc professors professors are allowed or even professors themselves are going this direction. There are a million ways to get there. And I think the, the most important thing for all of us to do personally is look in the mirror, look at the next 10 years of our life and say, what am I going to help do? I don't have to be the one teaching it. I don't have to get to that level of expertise necessarily to go teach these people, but I sure as heck can make sure that somewhere out there, there's a change happening and I can be the the person who does it. I can be the one who introduces the dean and has them watch the movie and has them go to Gabe's ranch or has them do this. And I can be that person who creates conditions so that what emerges easily is regenerative agriculture taught in all these major ag schools uh, versus just the chem guys dictating the whole curriculum. So just say, take it on, figure out where you can be the best service, what your skill sets are and to expand those. Seth, uh, Mark Ludwig here from the Allegan Conservation District. Can I jump in on the ag education for a moment? Uh, yes, please do. Uh, well, first of all, your your county probably has a soil conservation district, a conservation district. It may go under other names in your state. Uh, they are by law required to be liaisons to NRCS, the federal conservation people, and to take local priorities seriously. 
So if you want to kind of short circuit ag education and ag priorities in your county, get yourself elected to your county conservation district board of directors and become the person who is charged in your county with directing federal dollars. Now, do I say that as someone who thinks that that what is on paper actually happens in every in every office? No, but I do say that as somebody who knows that there are levers of power like this buried throughout the federal bureaucracy, throughout university bureaucracies. And, and let me also just say, as a graduate of Michigan State University, a land grant university was established in the 1800s to you know, provide these, these educational supports. You know, th those missions are buried deep in the charters of a major university in every ag state and, and, and beyond. So there are, I, I think there are ways to get in. And frankly, I, I saw a lot of work. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of work really starting since about 2010. You know, you can go back or forth and argue about where the, the starting line is, but really the, the soil health movement took off and was largely spurred along by these land grant universities early on. I think it's, I think it is unfair to say there is no credit to be had and no potential uh, you know, already well underway in most of these universities to promote these things. Uh, some of the most radical agricultural thinkers, thinkers I know are employed by these universities. And, and I and I, I use that term radical very, very, very purposefully, because there's a lot of people on Facebook who put all kinds of stuff out there uh, that's never going to happen. But these people at these universities are actually charged with making it happen. Their deliverables are making it happen. So they've got to put something out there that, that is actually doable, that is actually based on the science that they know. And frankly, I learned very good soil science you know, in the late 80s and early 90s at Michigan State taking soil science 101. The mineralogy, and the, the, the carbon cycle and all of that, that, that's been buried in the research for a long time. It is not that hard to get these universities moving in the right heart direction. In fact, they're probably out in front of you. Uh, a lot of us in, in many of these departments, there's somebody who's out in front of all of us because, gosh, they put a lot of smart people in those universities. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll end there. I totally right. agree with you, Mark, and I would love if you can email me and connect on how we can distribute those type of opportunities if, if you can, finning at kisstheground.com. We'd love to discuss how we can make those more available and aware for the whole inter international and national community. Hey, hey Seth, I just wanted just to jump in the, the yeah. last comment about the universities. Okay, so I, I as, as a Californian, I, I have a, you know, I, I want to see more, um, you know, universities jump into this, but let's be really clear. Um, the vast majority of all research dollars in the United States at land grant universities funded by Monsanto and Bayer and, and DuPont. And, um, this is an issue, you know, follow the money. Um, and, um, um, you know, we didn't have, there wasn't one school focused on regenerative agriculture uh, in the United States up until this last two years ago. And Chico State had, a, had, the, had the, the dean at the, uh, all of Chico State uh, and she became personally interested and the only way she could run i have a regenerative agriculture where you could actually invite people like myself and others to come and speak about how soil works and about the chemical issues was to put it not in the department of agriculture because she knew as soon as she put in the department of agriculture that then the clause would come out and i think it's i think it's let's just be really clear ask how many universities in the United States, whether it's Iowa State or K-State, has invited Ray Archuleta, Gabe Brown, Tim LaSalle, you know, go on down the list to speak. And I think you'll find it's, it's zero. We have an economic juggernaut in this food industry. It's, and, and I'm going back and forth on, on Facebook right now with a representative of the United Nations. It's a good man. And, you know, people are going like, you know, like, Oh, they have this big United Nations event coming up in September. We need to be we need to be real with what's actually going on versus and it's like it's like a balance. Like Finney and you want to get along with everyone, and I love that. And that's and and like I want to like like call out the bullshit that I see. But we need all of it. But in the United Nations, at, let me just ask you this: There will be a global summit on food in September. 
I want to ask everyone, how many regenerative leaders or indigenous agroecology farmers will be asked to speak to and uh, uh, to speak there uh, uh, there? I think the number is zero. This is 2021 and the United Nations representatives of all these countries. We need to understand the level of, of this. And at the same time, we got to speak at Congress. Thank you, Finian. And thank you for one person working to make that happen that told someone else. So there is power there. And can we get the United, can we get the United Nations to, to do this? Can we point out why is regenerative agriculture leaders banned from the United Nations speaking? We need to, I, I'd encourage all of you, we need to push back. And the other thing I'd like to say is the head of the of destroying uh, this regenerative agriculture movement is starts in the, in London. Everything that I, the article I wrote recently, it's I'm finding out it's coming back to London. It's the it's the University of Oxford. It's the Guardian. It's these billionaires that are pushing plant based. It's Bill Gates uh, and he's funding these things. And it's it's there's a big push. People need to work on London. I'll I'll stop my rant. Pass it back to, uh, to Seth. Uh, John, you and I are a rant tag team. Everyone knows that. And and amen, I agree with everything you're saying. Okay, let's um, move it on to the people who are patiently have their hands up. Um, Gil Jacobs. Gil Gates. I believe you. Yep. In England, yep. Gil is a woman. Um, yeah, someone before mentioned environmental groups and that's they should be more supportive of regenerative agriculture. Well, I've just been taking part in a zoom called what what Next summit um of environmentalists and through being put into a breakout room just of two people which was amazing i discovered a campaign here in in herefordshire against huge factories producing chickens importing um soya from brazil and polluting the rivers now this guy had never really heard of regenerative agriculture but needed information on how to help People, if they come out of the factories, how to produce chickens and animals in a regenerative way. And in England, we're not as far advanced as you. It's kind of building up, but it's much, I mean, I can't imagine in the House of Commons, someone like Gabe Brown presenting on regenerative agriculture yet. But we look to you and we, we follow what you're doing. That's great. But there is a huge gap. I mean, the gap is like some people like Greenpeace, going with Bill Gates and, and introducing um, horrendous agriculture into, into Africa and India. I mean, that's the level at which it is. So my question is, how advanced is it in America with the environmental charities? How advanced is, is what? linking up with regenerative agriculture. <clears throat> I'll just reply because I, I, I wrote a letter to all these environmental groups six years ago. I, I put some links in, in here. If, if, um, I, um, if you go, I'll put another link in a set, but the, um, of, the, of the 10 leading environmental groups in the United States, um, several of them, the second largest one, um, uh, the Sierra Club is promoting uh, Monsanto and, and uh, uh, Impossible Burger. And at the same time, because they're, they're also gonna show the Kiss the Ground film and Finian and, and my other allies that Kiss the Ground are, are trying to buddy up on them and I called them out on it. And, um, and then uh, the National Audubon Society is, is coming out for it, but there's a lot of groups who are sitting on the sidelines. There's an anti-cow, anti-grazing in the environmental movement. And the, the big leader though in it is the World Resource Institute which has 1600 people like their own government agency they basically they're the ones that are driving the un policy and the person who's in charge of the all the entire food imagine this you have 1600 people you could you have you just got a hundred million dollars from 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 uh, uh bezos the person in charge of it is a philosophy major from university of oxford who spent five years at mckinsey which is one of the worst you know, management consulting groups in the world. He's in charge. He has no knowledge of natural systems. And when I talked to their two other leading people who, who, who work for them, they were so dismissive. They're saying like, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, grazing animals on grasslands is way worse. That's way worse than capos, you know. And we, we don't take positions. We just follow the science. They, they have 1,600 people who are greenwashing the world 
for Monsanto, and they're using plant-based. I'm, I'm glad that there's people from England here. England is, you have to do the hard work there. And um, there are people doing good work. Patrick Holden is doing really good work in England there. Um, and so, uh, but I'll, I'll pass it back to Seth, but I'm, I'm like, as an environmentalist, I've worked with the Sierra Club. There's good people in there. The other thing, let's just, let's just get real clear. The dollar corruption, the, the people who fund environmental organizations in, in the world are mostly people who've made fortunes in Wall Street yeah. and foundations, and they're usually old white men, uh, notwithstanding Seth and I and, and others here on the, you know, that are, that are still trying to hold up our, our part of, 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 the, of uh, you know, uh, white men that are, that are trying to do a good job. But, but the bottom line is that's who's funding it. So even if the Sierra Club wanted to make a change, they can't get funding. The, you know what they want to be get funded? They, they, they get funded in America. They say coal, coal and oil is bad. That's bad. Solar and wind and Tesla is good. And we can make money in Wall Street. We'll just, we'll shut down coal plants and we'll build solar plants. We'll monetize that. We'll make money. When you say Monsanto is bad and grass is good and, and, and nature is good, you got to change McDonald's. You got, you got to change. You, you have to like, we have to like shrink down the economics. So that's part of the challenge today we're facing. Well, can I just announce there that McDonald's are investing heavily in regenerative agriculture in England. I did, there was an article in the Guardian, I think it was today. So um, I don't know how true yeah. that is. Yeah, there's a lot of greenwashing. I mean, so Chipotle did a did an ad, okay, like Chipotle did a big ad on regenerative ag or regeneration, right, Seth, in the TV, it was a TV ad, I think, you know, uh, in the Super Bowl. But the reality is you talk to producers, though, and they're like, it all comes down to the gross margin and and they want the cheap cheap it's all subsidized so it's a it's but it's a start and i know mcdonald's seth is, is a fan of mcdonald's a little because they're funding good research in the united states i mean they're doing horrible work in a lot of ways but they are doing some good things so we'll take it uh carl wants to make a quick comment go ahead yeah hi uh, I don't, i'm sorry if i'm mispronouncing your name is it gill or, or jill um who just spoke, but I wanted to say, yes, McDonald's is now funding a regenerative grazing program. Uh, it was just announced a couple of days ago. Uh, Peter Bick is involved with that, which I was very glad to see. Um, he's a, one of the leading grazing researchers here in the US. Uh, and also, um, Gil, or, or I believe it's Gil, I just uh, sent you a direct message. There's a fellow, Reginaldo Haslett Ameriquin, um, who's specifically focusing on transforming uh, the egg egg production, egg, the egg sector, um, into uh, regenerative agriculture. So the link that I sent you there in, uh, might be of interest. Thank you. Yeah, if I if I may uh, make a little comment, Seth, are you there? <laughs> go for it, Benoit. Okay, okay, I go for it. Uh, I, I I think Gabe was right when he was uh, insisting on education, because. Uh, a lot of people you talk to don't know what a trophic chain is. The fact that soils feed plants or, or, or grass, and grass feed animals and animals feed back the soil. This loop is not well understood by a lot of people we're talking to. Uh, it, it, there's, uh, there's a lack of education. And I have to admit, it, it does take a lot of energy and time to get familiar with all of these topics, you know? Uh, I, was, I was saying there will be nine negative emission technologies uh, in the next um, assessment report number six. Four or five of them will are biosource, but they're not all equal, you know, all of these negative emission technologies. And uh, I want to um, underline that there will be more coming, uh, uh, you know, um, Fast growing biomass can do amazing thing. And, and one general comment we had to get through is that nature is abundant. Nature is generous. I mean, the, the size of the herds that we had before, before, uh, uh, before we killed them and, and, and the dimension of, of the, uh, the uh, nature we had available in past millennium uh, was just, it's just unbelievable. Today we, 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 we dream of uh, abiding that. You know, nature is generous. Nature is abundant. And, and this message we have to get 
through um, you know, promoting sustainable development or regenerative development, generally speaking, is not going back necessarily to um, you know, a poor lifestyle. It's not at all, actually. I believe it's the contrary. Uh, I'm very critical of the consumption society, but at the same time, uh, the potential of generative agriculture and generative um, animal husbandry is just uh, infinite. I agree. This is Finian here. Uh, Seth and Carl, I have, to, I have to jump off here, but it's been a pleasure to be on with everyone. Uh, and and, and I just wanted to echo what, what John said is that we have to be willing to call out and we have to where we're depending on your strategy or the group strategy you're working with. All of these strategies are essential to move, move us all down the court. To me, watching, bring this back to the hearing that happened last Thursday, what I want to remind us of is if you listen to 80% of the representatives at least who were asking questions we're asking questions from a framework mindset or context that is not the quote unquote regenerative thinking mindset. They're thinking inside of the, as, as Seth mentioned, the do less harm thing. So that to me is where the breakthroughs of thinking is ultimately what, what I believe is, is going to shift the needle over is, is when people are able to see it. So, that's the beauty of this thing is when we see some of these folks who are representatives right now, who ultimately make decisions right now, as beholden as they might be to certain companies. And those are the ones who are saying, you know, you're, you're too beholden. You're never going to be listening because you have another thing that's prioritized you're listening. And that's a lot of cases, but those folks who have the openings and we can get them to get it and get the, them to get it further. That's where I think the education depth is so paramount because you can have someone see a movie and get it, but you know, working with Congressman Tim Ryan over the last year as he was running for, for president, he was willing and wanting to learn. So instead of just watching Kiss the Ground the movie or instead of just one time interaction, how do you develop a relationship where you're able to be the source of someone's depth of getting it so that they can become not just supportive, but an actual conduit for your message. And all of a sudden that's that's where I believe that investment in those type of relationships and building them is ultimately what's going to make this thing strong. So thank you all so much. Uh, appreciate the time. And, uh, and yeah, if you want to check out Kiss the Ground and, and get involved, please check out our, our website. Thank you so much. Thank you, Finian. Thank you, Finian. Okay, um, I know people have been jumping in, but we do have some hands raised. Um, John, your hand is still up. I wasn't sure if, if that was from before. Oh, I'm good. I'm, okay. I, I, I ran it enough. Okay. All right. So the next will be um, Jake y Yancey. My apologies if I'm not saying your name right. And Alexandra, Alexandra Craigie. So Jake Yancey, the floor is yours. Hey, Jake Yancey, Track and Y Ranch here. Appreciate the conversation. I appreciate Gabe taking the opportunity to speak with Congress. It was great hearing one of the common things, and I think that topic that often kind of irks me slightly. Uh, we run a fully a lease ground uh, carrier operation. Uh, we don't own any of our property. All of our property is owned by uh, stakeholders, mainly being conservation groups, as strange as that sometimes sounds. And often most of our properties are actually, um, some of them have a bunch of endangered species uh, that we're doing studies on trying to work with. One of the concerns often is speaking about how do we fund these in the long term. Uh, from an environmental standpoint, often the process is to keep those properties open and try to do as little with them. And really from a conservation standpoint, that's not fundable. Uh, if it's as other speakers have talked about, about um, ultimately prairie ground turning back into all forest and having no grass, that doesn't work. Uh, currently in our area in the Pacific Northwest, we deal with excessive rainfall. Uh, our properties get 70 to 100 inches of rain, which is quite different than many spots. Just the same, we have the same uh, reforestation type issues to keep the open prairie grounds that we do have open. Uh, current management practices has been burning and though that's worked in the past, the cost is not effective for those in the long term. And so that's where we're, our operation has came in and be able to reintroduce uh, grazing as a tool 
in that, as well as with such species as the checker spotted butterfly. And also we're doing some studies right now, uh, all with conservation groups doing it and backing the studies themselves. Um, but with the Oregon spotted frog is one of our biggest ones in some of our wetland grounds. And though many of our operations don't focus on um, the prime grazing season due to the rain and trying to maintain soil content. We're working with many of those conservation groups um, that some may refer to as environmentalists to really make a big difference in how they uh, recognize cattle grazing as more of a tool than anything. And that's helped us to address issues that have been brought up by this group is how do you work with funding? Well, we were able to show that the every five years, the amount of money that they're spending for burning every five years, and they're repeating that every single five years, uh, is the same amount that we can fence in the same amount of property. And those fences are lasting 25 to 30 years. And so when you talk about things like that, it creates some great opening conversations and ultimately has led our operation to where we're at today with Track and Wire Ranch. So thank you. And I appreciate the group kind of talking about these things. And I, I always try to, think the positive and stuff when we're working with the conservation groups and uh, the environmentalists is using cattle as a great tool to improve our soils and the environment. So thank you. Um, Jake, uh, thank you. Uh, let me just ask a follow-up question. Like how, how does that happen? Um, is everyone sitting in the room together or, I mean, it, it, it's a fascinating case study. I'd like to know more about, you know, how, how this works. Yeah, so this has been a great opportunity. Um, what we started off with the uh, Oregon spotted frog uh, was our biggest, uh, our start of this relationship. And this was with a conservation group that was in our area. And as being a first generation uh, younger farmer, the main thing that we did is we kind of joke about it, but we kind of Jehovah witnessed our pastures. And I say that in the sense that we literally just looked at Google Maps and saw open grounds that were available and went and knocked on doors. And what that often led us to was conservation groups. And what we did is we opened up the conversation with them simply about what is your management practice. And many of them, it was burning. Um, many of them, it was mowing, that they'd actually go in with weed eaters and mow. And especially that was the practice with the Oregon spotted frog, um, that they were going in with weed eaters and they're learning that the Oregon spotted frog, for instance, uh, prefers to lay its eggs in short grasses. And from a conservation standpoint, what they had done is they had removed all sort of agriculture production or anything off those grounds. Well, what had subsequently happened, obviously, is grasses had grown up extremely high. And what they started to do is they were losing Oregon spotted frog habitat like crazy. And they didn't realize that there was a direct correlation between those short grasses and the Oregon spotted frog population. And so what we're doing is instead in the fall, they used to go in and um, weed eat that and mow it or in some of the prairie grounds, they were burning it. And in exchange, what we do is we go in and graze that. Now, our grazing windows are all based on, um, if it's for the or if checkered spotted butterfly, obviously it's later in the season, uh, post flower stage, which from a producer only standpoint, if our only interest is in growing the best feed that we can for our animals, uh, it would not be the best feed and is not. Just the same, we're making use out of ground that has, hasn't had animals on it for years and years and years. And we're bringing back production. And what's really interesting for us is we've been doing um, average daily gains on our pastures and we're seeing some really great returns. As a matter of fact, last year, our highest average daily gains was on a um, Oregon spotted frog pasture. So it's been great from us from a producer standpoint. Um, we're writing reports and presenting those as part of the study. Um, and it's been a great thing, but Ultimately, the main thing is we're communicating with the conservation groups um, and talking to them because in our nation, they control a lot of that property. And ultimately, we all have the same goals. They want to increase, increase habitat for wildlife, um, protect endangered species, and ultimately, um, us as producers have that same interest many of those times. Hey, uh, Jake, I want to stick with you for a minute. Um, are, are you a member of the Soil for Climate Facebook group? I believe I'm on that group now as well. Okay. All uh, right. <laughs> That's group number 1001, right? All right. Well, listen, um, this is, you're, you're really, you're really hitting it on the head here. I mean, this is really important. You're working with the conservation groups. You're working with private and public landowners. It's leased land. 
um, your, your grazing and not even in the way that your is optimal um, in terms of what the animals need, but you're making a sacrifice. And so everyone is sort of giving and experimenting a little bit. And like, to me, that's fascinating. Like that really should be written up and, and will you please post it in the Soil for Climate group, post a little, you know, discussion and a link and feel free to email me. I'm just seth.itscan at gmail.com or, or soilforclimate at gmail. You know, it'll get to me um, because this is, this is what we need. You know, it's that, is that, um, that, that compromise or that dance or that, you know, that, the two-step so to speak, of the different groups working together for the benefit of, of everyone, you know, ultimately, you know. Um, and then, you know, you, you know, bro, uh, one quick sec, like, okay, for you as the frog. So, you know, the National Audubon Society has the conservation ranching program. I'm sure you know about that. What about the birds? And uh, Russ Concer's company, Blue Nest Beast, uh, Blue Nest Beast, <laughs> we'll edit that out, Blue Nest Beef, um, you know, is sourcing from ranchers who are part of the National Audubon Society, you know, conservation ranching program. So it's just this fascinating co combination of ranching for a profit um, within a system of which there's other stakeholders who have strong environmental goals and all that's working together. And climate isn't even an issue. Like they're not even talking about climate yet. You know, the soil carbon is increasing. You know, there's more photo evapotranspiration going on. You're helping the climate in multiple dimensions. And, and that isn't even an objective. So, so this is the perfect scenario, like what you're describing here. So please write it up, communicate it. I'm glad we just connected just now, for sure. I appreciate it. We also post on our uh, Facebook page, Track and Y Ranch, uh, on our on Facebook, and we're on YouTube and Instagram mm -hmm. as well. So I'll put mm -hmm. that, post that in the link. So thank you for your time, guys, and thanks yeah, for the yeah. work. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, let's go to Alexandra. Uh, her hand has been up. Alexandra, the floor is yours. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm coming in from London. I thought the time was different and I'd be asleep. So I'm very pleased to come across it on Facebook. Um, I just wanted to speak up slightly in defense of the UK. There's two university degrees and two universities doing regenerative agriculture. I've only looked at one in detail and it looks really, really interesting. The second one, um, one's at Schumacher College, which is one I've looked at, in Devon, and the other one is uh, Whittle College in Essex. I just thought that's really exciting to see, given the conversation we had a little while ago. The other thing I want to mention is there's what's called an all-party parliamentary group on agroecology that's looking at soil and food and food systems. Um, and the all-party parliamentary groups aren't meeting at the moment, which is, which is the big problem. So I was going to go to one of their things before the pandemic erupted, and of course it was cancelled. Uh, but it has parliamentarians from every single... All the all party parliamentary groups have parliamentarians from every single party who meet to study and look and they bring in various charities and things like the Soil Association go, the Land Workers Alliance, um, the Alliance for Better Farming, the Countryside Alliance, no, sorry, the, uh, the Countryside um, uh, chari um, Charity, um, uh, there's something called LEAF, which is another charity here, Compassion and Wild Farming has presented there. And I know I've had a conversation with the um, CEO, Philip Limbury, of who's of, sorry, of Compassion World Farming. And he's been to White Oak Pastures. And he's a really big fan of regenerative agriculture. The problem is, is the charity's Facebook page is absolutely infuriating. It's all about fake meat. And I, I can only engage a certain amount where I just get absolutely exasperated. But I've met Philip a couple of times. And at some point, I just want to really, uh, I know at one point of one of the regenerative, his savory trained regenerative agriculture farmers I know in the UK, he was having a conversation with her about um, having paying or funding, having um, um, chickens or uh, hens follow her cows follow her cattle 
um, just like white oak pastures. But unfortunately, no nothing came of that at the time. Partly the, the pandemic happened um, two months later. So um, I just wanted to speak up for that. And I also thought, Jill, I've sent you a private message. I don't know if you'd like to connect. You know, if we're in the UK, I don't know if there's anybody else in the UK on this that would like to connect with me. Um, I think it'd be really interesting. Um, because there are, it, it is happening here and there's a key places where it's happening. I just worry about the Schumacher College because I think it's vegetarian. And so their idea of uh -huh. agriculture may not be the same as ours. Um, okay, I, I mean, as I say, you know, because I'm not going to do a course, a degree, I don't think. I only looked at it. It'd be lovely to connect. I'll, I'll yeah, so I'm upset. I sent you a personal message, so do, okay. do, do connect. But I suppose at least it's being discussed and it's they're not just talking about chemical ag, but, you know, even if they're vegetarian. I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> Um, you know, I would love to um, see a Soil for Climate UK group start. And okay. Per perhaps you two will be will be the champions of that. Yeah. Um, uh, so I mean, I've, I've I've learned so much from this group. I really really have. A, um, what what you and Carl have have built has been fantastic. So it's it's been life changing for me. It's been life changing. Well, 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 you know, thank you. And, 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 you know, the, the, the virtual background I have here, let me sort of move my head out of the way, you know, that's actually me next to the tree there that's in Zimbabwe. Oh, yeah. And uh, that's the same spot. And um, I, what I'm, I'm standing in, that's what that's called high secession perennial grass, it's Panica maximum and heteropogon contortus. Or the Latin names, they call it spear grass and guinea grass is the local term. But you can see that's a high secession grass. Um, and then this is the exact same spot, <laughs> moving my head. You know, so, so as I put it, I've stood in the efficacy. And then you talk about life changing, that's, that's life changing, you know. Um, and, um, and so we need to help educate the, the UK, the, the cytotels, cytotels of, uh, of, you know, of, of higher learning, you know, Oxford, wow. and, then, and then the Guardian, of course, is just a platform for George Monbiot to just spew all this hatred against uh, regenerative agriculture and Alan Savory, and I've even been, you know, targeted. So, um, you know, it's personal. <laughs> Um, but anyway, but we need, we need, uh, champions in the UK. Um, and, uh, if you two want to do a UK soil for climate group, you know, we can make that work. Um, all right, let's, um, let's go to, um, Benoit. I don't know if your hand is up again, or if it's just left over from last time, but I see you still with your hand raised. And then I think we'll, we'll call it, we'll call it a day. It's been uh, over two hours for me now. Benoit, your hand is still raised. Was that left over from before? Well, it's left over from uh, the last It's left over from before. Okay. Well, um, then I think I'd like to take this to a close. Um, it's over two hours for us. Um, I have a quick question, though, about all the great comments that have been put in here. Are these still available? I mean, when I close this thing, we don't lose those forever, do we? Does anyone else have... Better experience I'm with that. The file. I'm saving it. You're saving the comments threads because it's a great the chat. Yeah, the, the chat. That's what I meant. Okay. All right. Well, then uh, I'm happy to um, to bring this to a, to a close. Again, let me put in a pitch for uh, the movie "Kiss the Ground" for Gabe Brown's company, which is called Nourished by Nature. And for the Soil for Climate nonprofit organization, um, you can support us in general, or you could also give specifically to the Kenya Fund. And if you give $300, you can name a cow. And if you give $3,000, you can uh, name a herd. Um, in Facebook, you know, you can do your own fundraiser. We are a nonprofit that's registered with Facebook. So you can do your own fundraiser so if in your own fundraiser, for example, you raise $300, then, then you could name the cow. And, you know, it's not just about the $300. It's about, it's about the idea of 
buying a cow as part of a climate solution. Like that itself is the profound sort of breakthrough. And so to have a, and in my opinion, so to have a fundraiser where you say, well, we're buying a cow for, for soil, for climate, and it'll be part of this herd that's managed regeneratively in Kenya, you know, with, 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 on Maasai lands. You see, the messaging around that is just what's so powerful, you know, not the specific amount of money. So, so this is something you can do for yourself. Anyone can do this. Anyone can start a fundraiser for any nonprofit that's listed on Facebook. In fact, we're also going to be listed on Amazon. So even like when you buy something on Amazon, you can choose to give a certain amount of money to any of the nonprofit. I'm sure there's you know hundreds of thousands of nonprofits. But anyway, we'll be one of them. So so there you go. And you can also buy these hats. Um, Fifty five percent hemp, 45% organic cotton. So we're happy about that. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy to bring this to a close. Does anyone else have any important last words? If not, then I'm, uh, this is a certain way I like to end. I like to, to unmute and everyone just at the same time say bye and we could get the cacophony of, of voices. All bye. right. <laughs> bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, let me hear some more. Some more vocal buys happening. Bye. 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 Okay. All right. Good. Go. Good. Go. Bye. Bye, kids. Bye, Sarah. All right. Bye, Sarah. Oh, here. Let me go on gallery, gallery view. Yeah, there's gallery view. Okay, bye. everyone. Okay, bye. Love you all. Bye. Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you. Bye. Stay in touch. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.